Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this session. Uh, my name is Christian Browner. I work uh, at Canonical, um, and uh, I'm a maintainer of the Lexi, Lexi, LexiFS, and related projects. Um, together with Stefan, with the project leaders for both of the for, for all of these projects, um, but I also work a lot on the uh, on the upstream kernel and uh, maintain various pieces in there. And um, I have a pretty solid focus on on containers and um, specifically on privileged containers, both in, in in the kernel and in user space, uh, but also. Um, on the VFS and uh, process management in the recent in the recent years, um, uh, and today I want to talk about uh, the new Mount API that has made it into the kernel over the last uh, two years, um, which I found to be pretty exciting and that has the potential to make a lot of the stuff that we have to do in user space with containers uh, currently in a clunky way because of the new old Mount API. Um, in a much in a much simpler way, and also uh, has great potential for extensibility to uh, implement newer features uh, in the future. But today, I'm um, so the the plan I have is roughly um, I want to go through uh, I want to introduce the concept of a of a mount. Well, basically, in a in a in a rough sense, introduce the concept of a mount and what different aspects this has uh, this involves. Um, and then I want to go over the old mount API um, and uh, possibly and also mention a few of its limitations um, and then introduce the new mount API step by step uh, by taking a look at the various syscalls involved. But I also want to be quite, um, I hope to be quite demo heavy. We'll, I need to see how we'll do on time. I. I I'm not a fan of re-recording the same talk over and uh, over and over again. So we'll see what we do on time. You get the real uh, real life experience here. So if switches to the new slide, um, mounting. Uh, so mounting comes in different flavors in the Linux kernel. Um, the, this, the thing that most people associate with mounts is mounting a proper file system like an external hard disk or a USB stick. And that usually involves the creation of what the kernel calls a super block, which is a representation for this new file system object. Um, but uh, the Linux kernel also allows you to create what we call bind mounts. That means, for example, you can take an existing directory uh, located on your file system or a, a file and make it available at a different location. You can also bind mount an already existing mount point um, somewhere else. So this is quite, quite flexible. Um, and bind mounts are very important for containers uh, because we need to, like for example, when we share devices between the host and the container that are necessary for the container to work, uh, we usually bind mount dev null and dev zero into the container from the host step. So we bind mount, um, uh, bind mount single files actually into the container. And um, bind mounts and, and the super block can have different properties, it's exciting. So, a bind mount, for example, can be made read only uh, while the super block is actually read write. But the other way, it doesn't work. So if the super block is read only, it will turn all uh, bind mounts of the same super block uh, read only. Uh, because super block properties essentially, if they are overwritable, um, can't be if if the super block sets a specific property such as read only that can also be set per bind mount and usually the more restrictive property uh, of the super block will uh, override all of the uh, bind mount properties which which is the same choice if you make a super block which represents is act like a representation of the hard disk or USB device. Um, for your for your operating system, and you turn that read only. You don't want it. You basically want to turn all of the mounts where this is visible read only. So this is quite consistent. Um, and internally, mounting is usually centered around a a struct that is called a VFS mount, and that holds all of the necessary information associated with a mount, including 
um, various mount options such as mount flex, read only, no suit, uh, and and so on. Um, yeah, um, there's also mount namespaces, which uh, basically regulate what kind of uh, you get your own private mount table. This is what usually people associate with mount namespaces. So that mounts and you mounts in one mount namespace don't propagate. So show up in uh, another mount namespace. And this is quite important for the container use case because obviously a container, if you run uh, another init system in your container, it might mount or unmount various file or various uh, file systems, tempfs or slash temp, and you don't want it to affect uh, the host. This is what mount namespaces are for. And then you also have mount propagation, which we'll not go into in any great detail uh, um, today. Um, and both of these things introduce quite a bit of complexity in, into the kernel, especially mount propagation, um, which is basically you can think of a bunch of tunnels between different mount namespaces. This is all almost uh, always how I envision it, but this is out of scope in, in the sense of time for this for this talk but you can ask questions of course um after this session um so the old mount api well as you can see or as most people will probably know um the old mount api is a based on a single syscall i'm now ignoring the u mount uh, syscalls that exist to actually unmount an already uh, mounted file system um but um, it's it's not relevant. We're just concerned with uh, creating new mounts here uh, for this talk. Um, single syscall, um, and it's used for a variety of operations. So if you, for example, you can create a new super block trying to mount it, for example, a real disk device or a USB stick, like I mentioned before. Um, but it also can be used to create a bind mount of a directory file or another existing mount. It can be used to remount uh, a super block or uh, so a whole file system or um, a mount, so change the mount options of a, of a mount point. Um, so this makes the mount syscall, the old mount syscall, like it's a actually just a multiplexer because they usually aren't a great idea multiplexers because it means that the syscall overloads different operations that would be better should better be represented in separate syscalls um, but it is what it is and the the mount syscall has been around for a long time and people have lived with this for a long time but obviously this doesn't mean we can come up with something better in in the future if should we uh, should we need to redesign the mount api and it, actually, uh, there was a reason for that. Um, so the API can be quite a bit uh, difficult uh, to use. It's full of quirks and legacy behavior. That's just how, what happens uh, over time. Um, one thing I want to uh, point out uh, as a quirk is uh, making a uh, read-only mount of an existing uh, existing file system, existing uh, bind mount, uh, so a directory or so on is quite cumbersome. You cannot do it uh, in one step. So if you see right here, I, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but we're on the first dash. Um, create a new file system for an X4 file system. That is not a problem. Okay, we got this here. You create a new uh, X4 mount for def SDA at the location mount with the, the no suit flag. But below here, we create a new bind mount, right? Uh, for we mount slash temp to uh, slash mount to slash temp. Um, and create a bind mount. If we were to specify MS read only, and we wanted, let's assume we wanted to make this read only, it, it's no, of no use to specify MS bind in conjunction with MS read only, you would still end up with a read write mount point, which is super uh, uh, unintuitive, right? So, um, and actually to make sure that the mount is uh, read only, um, you then uh, need to make sure uh, you then need to remount, so you need to specify MS bind, MS read mount, MS read only uh, on the same mount point, and then you end up with a uh, read only bind mount. There is a weirder quirk where you, when you specify MS bind with together with MS rec, which means um, make me a, a, a recursive bind mount copying the whole mount tree at the location that I specified. And you specify the MS read only flag for that. Only the uppermost mount will be turned read only, 
uh, all of the other um, all of the other amounts will not be turned uh, read only. So in uh, in my example, what I actually did um, right here, and I'm sorry for that. This, the first example should have read MS bind um, MS rec. Um, so the fact that you only turn the uppermost mount of your mount tree that you clone read only, and not the whole every mount uh, under that under the mount. Um, is, is quite a problem and has led to CVEs in user space. But there is no nice way to fix this because changing that behavior would break um, user space. So the only option to fix this would be to introduce a new flag, for example, MS Recreate only, but then you end up with a flag that combines two different sem semantical things, right? It combines making read only with the recursive property and that's just weird. So uh, for example, this is one obvious limitation of the uh, old mount API. And then you're also getting into the territory where you're slowly running out of flags, I think. Um, also, the API, as you might have noticed, based on the arguments, is purely path-based. So source and target need to be uh, absolute. Well, they don't need to be absolute paths, but um, they uh, they need to be path based, so it's not file descriptor based, which is problematic if you want to do delegated mounting or, or uh, sh for example, share a file descriptor with another task. That all that won't work, and in the new mount API, that uh, will actually work. So you see, there is a lot of room for improvement, but uh, as I said, the mount syscall has served us well for a long time. No reason to force everyone to use the new mount API, but um, maybe I can convince some people that it's actually worth it. Uh, so let's switch to the new Mount API. Well, the obvious cool thing is that it's, uh, instead of being path-based, uh, something I just critiqued seconds earlier, uh, the new Mount API is file descriptor based. In fact, you can use the new Mount API without using any paths at all, which is obviously always excellent for security. Um, and instead of having a single syscall to do all of the things at the same time, the new mount API splits is split into multiple syscalls. Um, so it splits superflock creation and a superflock uh, and modification from bind mount creation um, and making a mount visible in the file system is also a separate operation, which is great because now you can have what is called anonymous or detached mounts. And since it's uh, FD based, this means it's possible to create a detached mount of a directory, for example, uh, or an existing, uh, yeah, of a, of a directory, um, and then uh, not really mount this uh, file system. So there is no representation for this mount that you just created in the file system. It's not reachable by traversing via the terminal, for example. Um, that's not possible. Um, so you can have private mounts per process, and the process can still uh, use DFD to traverse the new file system, to mount and open and create files and so on. Um, so that's a nice property that the new mount API supports. Um, so let's look at the individual, uh, the individual syscalls that uh, comprise this uh, new mount API. Um, there will likely be uh, another system call in the future. Um, because it's not fully it's not fully complete to some extent. Uh, so this FS open syscall creates a new file system context, and the file system context is basically just in kernel state, if you want to think of it like this. Um, and this file system context can then be used uh, uh, later on. Oops, later on to be configured um, with uh, an additional. Uh, with additional syscalls. Um, we can actually, um, let's see, uh, let's look a bit at source code while we're doing this. This is actually something I want to do. So I'm stopped to share this now, and I'm going to present and share another window with you where we are in the terminal, and I hope I made this big enough. So, um, uh, let's look at uh, FS, uh, FS open. This is where the FS open syscall, for example, lives. Um, so this is where you create a new file system context in the kernel. We won't get into, into too many details. Um, and you need to be uh, NS capable um, with the 
with respect to the owning user namespace of uh, your current uh, mount namespace. It means you need to have the CAPSIS admin capability in the mount namespace, um, in the user namespace of the mount namespace. Um, this is a restriction. Um, it supports the FS open call exec flag, which turns a files, uh, which turns the file descriptor. Uh, it returns in uh, close on exec, which is always a, a great advice uh, to use that by default. Um, and it returns a file descriptor for the file system context it just created. So let's say you wanted to create an X4 file system, you would call FS open, for example, um, X4, uh, and then FS open, uh, clo exec. This would be the system call to create a new file system context. That file system context does, has no meaning. So it's not a mount. You can't do anything with this. It's basically just a representation for in kernel state for the in kernel FS um, context, right? Um, so this is what this uh, what this system call uh, is essentially uh, is all about. It gives you a handle on in uh, in kernel state. Um, let's switch back to the presentation um, and whoops. Yeah. So um, this. Uh, um, this FS open context uh, is an anonymous file, anonymous inode file descriptor. Most file descriptors in the Mount API that do not represent actual file system objects, so files or directories in the file system. Um, um, and anonymous inodes basically are a bunch of file descriptors that all share the same inode uh, because they don't need a full inode. They just represent, a, it, think of it as representing some form of in kernel state or an in kernel object. In our case, it's a context. Um, that that is kept track of. So the kernel now is a context for an X4 file system uh, and is waiting for you to do something with it, essentially. Um, closely related to the FS open uh, system call is the FS pick system call, um, which lets you uh, create a file descriptor for an already existing super block. So this must be, um, this must be a, uh, yeah, an FS context that has that already existed essentially. It gives you a new FD for it. Um, it follows the open ad pattern of opening a path. So meaning you have a directory file descriptor. This is the first argument or um, a, a path argument and they can be interpreted in relation to each other. So if the file descriptor refers to a directory and you specify a non-absolute path, then this path will be resolved relative to the directory that the file descriptor specifies. If it's an absolute path, the file descriptor that is ignored. And if the special uh, at FDCVD, CWD um, uh, value is passed for a directory file descriptor, then the path is taken to be relative to the current uh, working directory of the calling process. And FSPIC also supports a range of flags. So it also allows you to make the file descriptor read on, uh, the file descriptor close on exec. Um, it allows you to specify that you don't uh, want uh, you don't want uh, trailing sim links to be followed, uh, and a no auto mount uh, allows you to specify that you don't want to trigger auto mounts during path lookup because usually the default is if you look up paths, then auto mounts will be uh, will be triggered. And FSPIC empty path specifies that the operation for this uh, to create a new context for an exist FS context for an existing super block uh, will be uh, performed directly on the directory file descriptor. So the directory file descriptor must uh, refer to uh, the mount root of a file system. So the root mount uh, of, a, of a file system. And both file descriptors give you an FS context file descriptor uh, for uh, in kernel state. Uh, back. And okay, now you have this FD, that's great. Um, this file descriptor can now be used to uh, configure the FS context that it refers to. So uh, FS config allows you to configure set uh, file system, uh, various specific file system uh, file system options. Um, you see you have the FSFD argument, which takes the file descriptor that the FS open and FS pick system calls give you and the unsigned int command. So the second argument uh, takes a bunch of the flags you see here on the screen 
uh, and then based on this on the flag uh, you're on the sorry on the command you're passing uh, uh, the key value and aux arguments are uh, are used and which ones are used depends on the command so for example if you want to set a flag on the fx uh, fs context object in the kernel um, then you pass the value through the key argument um, so you specify fs config set flag in the command argument and then uh, specify the argument the actual value that you want to pass in the key argument um, you can set a string parameter, parameter, so for example, the source of amount via the fsconfig set, um, uh, set string argument. Um, and uh, so, the, for example, if you want to set the source, then you specify source in the key argument, and you, then you specify the path in the value argument. The binary uh, command lets you set uh, binary arguments through the aux uh, argument. And the FS config set path argument and the FS config uh, set path empty arguments are basically what you would expect from so give you open at semantics even with this is called so if you uh, specify path then you can pass a DF, a DF file descriptor through the aux argument um, and the value argument will be interpreted as a path or the key argument um, and if you specify uh, uh, empty set if the empty uh, path empty then the aux argument will be used to be directly the path will be directly looked at based on the uh, aux argument um, and the last ones are the more uh, for our uh, talk today are the really interesting ones namely fs config command create and fs config um, configure uh, reconfigure uh, fs config command create finishes finalizes the creation of a fs uh, fs context so after this you cannot uh, uh, reconfigure you cannot configure it anymore with the fs config system call and the super block is actually created um, in the kernel and this requires the caller either to be kept as admin in the current user namespace if the file system is mountable inside of user namespaces for example proc or to be kept as admin in the initial user namespace if it is not mountable inside user namespaces. Um, and the uh, fsconfig uh, command reconfigure argument actually reconfigures, uh, finalizes the reconfiguration of, uh, of a super block. So a file descriptor context that you have gotten via the fspick system call we talked about uh, we talked about um, before. So this is uh, FS open, FS config, and um, FS pick are concerned with uh, creating super blocks for file systems, essentially. And finally, FS mount system call. This is uh, what we have been waiting for because this is the point where we um, turn an FS context file descriptor into an actual mount. So in order to get here, we need to have called FS mount or uh, FS mount and fsconfig, and we must have called fsconfig command create. These are the three steps. We will see this later on in the demo. Um, and uh, because then you basically said, I'm done configuring this file system context. I now am ready to turn this into a usable, into a usable mount file descriptor. So you pass in the fs context file descriptor you received, and then you can specify in the flags argument fs mount call exec again, so that the file descriptor that you get from fs mount will be closed on exec by default. And then in the ms flags argument, you can set properties on the mount that you're now creating. So for example, you can turn the mount read only, as you see here, mount adder read only, no C suit, so no set UID binaries on this mount, no devices on this mount. Uh, no execution of binaries on this mount, and then you can also set um, uh, what time options, you, what access time options um, you want. And then FS mount gives you a file descriptor back. And um, let's take the time to quickly look at the system call in the source code as well. The other ones are interesting as well, but um, this would take way too much uh, time if we were to do this. So you should have hopefully. Um, have seen this, give me a second. And FS mount, uh, we need to switch to a file called namespace.c, FS mount. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, 
Aha, uh -huh, there we are. So this is the syscall, uh, FS mount syscall. Um, it's the same uh, restriction, may mount. Uh, what it does, it checks that you are the uh, Capsys admin in the user namespace of uh, your current mount namespace. That's all it does. Then it checks that all of the flags are valid and so on. Uh, it's only valid flags are passed. And here you see, um, here the magic essentially happens. It takes this FS context file descriptor and uh, it verifies that it's actually an FS context file descriptor. You see it right here. This is FS context uh, FOPS. So it verifies that the file operations that re uh, belong to this file are actually uh, of FS context, of the FS context type. So any other file descriptors will be uh, rejected. <clears throat> And then it will verify that you're on the correct phase, so that essentially you uh, uh, that you have finished the FS config, uh, the FS config call, um, and then it creates a new mount. The FS uh, it creates a new mount, and uh, it allocates a new mount namespace. See it right here. Sets this all up. It opens the, uh, the uh, path uh, for this new mount, uh, and then it allocates in your file descriptor and it returns it to you. So this whole system call actually turns the FSFD, the FS context file descriptor into an actual mount. So from this point on, uh, you can do something with this. You can open files and so on with this. So this is, uh, and this is a point to stress. Let me switch back to the slides real quick. Up and there we go. Uh, this is important to notice. After this uh, system call returns you a file descriptor, um, you can interact with the file system that you just mounted. So you can open files in there by passing this to the open add system call and then passing uh, paths alongside it. You can create new files in there. You can actually operate on this thing without it having any representation in the file system. Um, which is great, something which you couldn't easily do with the old mount API. With the old mount API, you would have to mount it, get a file descriptor for it, and then unmount it. And then you get sort of the similar thing, but you still have to have it visible at some point in the file system with the old mount API. With the new mount API, if you call it FS mount, there is no representation of the thing actually in, uh, in the file system yet. A very cool system call, which I want to go to and uh, go uh, touch on briefly, is the OpenTree system call, which is the system call with which you create actual bind mount, something which I said was muddled together with creating um, a new super block for a file system in the old mount API. It's the same thing as with fspick. Um, you can pass a file descriptor argument that can refer to a directory, and then you can pa also pass a path alongside it. If it's a relative path, it will be resolved relative to the dear file descriptor that you passed in. Um, and if uh, you specify, for example, if you specify um, um, uh, at empty path, then you can operate directly on the directory uh, on the directory file descriptor. Um, it takes a couple of flags, OpenTree, CloExec, which obviously just turns the file descriptor that is returned from OpenTree into a close on exec file descriptor. Um, if you don't specify OpenTree clone, you get a file descriptor for an existing, for an existing, uh, uh, and it, it is an existing mount, then it not, it, no copy is created, but uh, you uh, get a file descriptor for this mount um, and you can reconfigure it. So this is basically remounting a file system and open remounting a bind mount, sorry. And OpenTree clone, this is really cool. OpenTree clone clones uh, a mount and creates you a new detached mount and the directory that you're specifying or the file that you're specifying doesn't need to be a mount in itself. So it basically turns a directory or files into mounts. This is what OpenTree does, which is amazing. And at recursive, if you specify alongside it with OpenTree clone, um, it copies the whole mount tree. So every mount uh, under a given directory file descriptor uh, will be referred to by this file descriptor that OpenTree uh, uh, gives back to you. So this is, uh, this is really great. This is how you create bind mounts now. Um, and detached bind mounts, the same principle as with the FS mount system call. So if you uh, 
um, it isn't attached to the file system, right? So, for example, if you do OpenTree uh, on a uh, on an existing directory with OpenTree clone at recursive, and then somebody unmounts the file system, you have your own private mount. You can change uh, you can change things on it. You can create flags. You can uh, create new files and so on, um, which is pretty amazing. Sorry, you can't change flags. This is something I'm working on, but. Um, you can create files and traverse through the, the mount that you just created. I'm making heavy, heavy use of this in LexD and LexC already. It's pretty good. And last but not least, it looks scary. It looks complicated, but it's actually not that complicated, is the move mount system call. This is the system call that takes either um, a file descriptor referring to, um, referring to an FS context, or to a uh, op file descriptor gotten from OpenTree um, and attaches it to the file system. So it makes it visible in the file system. And you have a variety of options that you can specify. So from DFD, from path, that's the same principle as with FSPIC. Uh, this is the source directory and into to DFD and uh, to path. And this is the target directory. And the resolve rules are exactly the same. Uh, it's just that the source and target both uh, can be passed uh, uh, can be passed in this style. And you have a bunch of MS, MS flags that regulate how, uh, how DFD, these both directory file descriptors and these both paths are supposed to be interpreted. Um, so if, you, if they're supposed to uh, follow symlinks, if they're supposed to follow auto, trigger automounts, if, uh, you, uh, if the, it's supposed to be operated directly on the file descriptor itself without actually resolving the path, this is the at empty path argument. Um, and this is duplicated, obviously. So F symlinks applies to from DFD and T symlinks applies to do DFD. Um, yeah, so this is uh, pretty pretty great. Um, so this lets you do a variety of things. You can move mounts from one place to another. You can attach uh, FS context file descriptors, um, attach mount file descriptors gotten from FS mount into OpenTree uh, uh, that have no representation in the file system yet um, to specific paths uh, in the file system. Uh, so that's pretty great. Um, and uh, this is uh, basically it. Um, I try to be a bit faster here because I actually want to have sufficient time to do some demos of how this works because it's pretty theoretical and what you really want is uh, to program with this stuff. Um, so I'm going to set up the demos uh, and uh, then I'll be right back and uh, we'll continue. Uh, that's at least what I suggest. So see you in a little bit. So let's do some demos. Um, first of all, I need to stop presenting here. Then share my terminal with you, this one. Um, hopefully this is large enough for everyone to see. Um, zoomed this out quite a bit. Uh, zoomed in quite a bit. So um, you can probably, so first of all, I need to go into demo parts I wanted to do. And then this. this is probably the first thing that we want to do. Let's just wipe this and then start from scratch. Um, so I prepared a, a little header, missing syscalls that <clears throat> defines all of the missing syscalls and syscall numbers. Mm. Um, they're mostly the same on all architectures for new syscalls, apart from a few odd ones such as alpha, MIPS, and uh, IA64. Um, but I've taken care to define all of the syscalls we care about, open tree, move mount, FS open, FS config, um, FS mount, FS pick, um, the mount attributes that we can specify with FS mount, um, and the various flags for the individual system call, and then simple wrappers for all of the system calls themselves, FS open, FS mount. Um, 
fsconfig, move mount, fspick, and open tree. Um, and also a little helper just to basically dot that we can easily exit with an error message when um, uh, when an unrecoverable error should happen. So this is pretty uh, it's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. We're using C for this because it's close to the operating system and um, fairly easy to read. So uh, first of all, what we want to do, first example, you want to mount a real file system. It's pretty straightforward. But what you would usually do is um, uh, mount, uh, in this case, this is uh, dev loop 10, I think. And then slash mount, um, and ms read only zero. I think this should cover it, but this is x four. This is the mount syscall that we essentially want to translate. So um, we have a real file system that uh, I set up already. Not x forty four, but x four uh, on dev loop ten. Um, so I mounted on a loop device, and uh, what you want to do is we want to mount this. So usually, what you would do is internet mount. Uh, should uh, small zero, and I, I don't know, failed to mount x four file system, and. I prepared my header correctly. Uh -huh. So, um, standard mounts is call. If I do, uh, then I see we'll have mounted a file system of x4 at slash mount. Um, I can U mount this. And now we want to translate this into the new mount API. So, this thing then becomes, first we want to create an uh, FS context like I mentioned before. Uh, for make the file descriptor close on exec. Now we want to die. Failed to create for context. And then we need to do Uh, configure the context actually that we just created um, by setting uh, the source. So uh, source and the source in this case is as I pointed out before is loop 10 and uh, no flags. And if we get an unexpected return value, we just do die erno. And for this case, let's be a bit simpler to go quicker. Let's just do it. We failed at fsconfig. Now, let's say we've, we are finished uh, configuring our file system context. Now we want to finalize it and actually create the mount to do this. Well, uh, to create a super block. Um, to do this, we call fs command create. Um, this becomes no, this becomes no. Um, let's say call this create and let's call this uh, set source. And then we finally create the actual, sorry, now we're creating the actual super block of causing the kernel to uh, allocate a super block. Um, read only. I'm telling you nonsense. FS config is where we create the super block. We're now actually creating a mount. Um, FD smaller zero. We can say die Erno with a with FS mount. And now, finally, we have a detached mount right now. Uh, we still haven't this anywhere visible in the file system. So if we were to compile this and then do sudo uh, dash mount glfs and then would do find mount, then you would see it's not mounted. Anything is not mounted anywhere. So we're missing a last crucial step. And this is red move mount in this case, a mount fd. And uh, we're passing in an invalid value because we're not mounting based off a of file descriptor in this case, or we're not moving based off of my, a file descriptor. We want to move to slash mount, and uh, we want to specify that for the source, we're moving mount 
we're moving empty path. So we're operating directly on the mount of the file descriptor. And then smaller zero, and we say, I error now, um, and we fail with move mount. Now, compile, and let's run. And uh, we'll see, cool. We just created an X format. So this is what it would look like to create, um, to mount a file system in a new mount API. Usually, I mean, this is a lot more syscalls, but it's it's cleaner, it's clearer. And also usually you configure a lot more stuff when you set up a, a super block. Um, and if, if, you, if you don't want to be fussed with all of that, I mean, you can still use the old uh, mount system call, but this is sort of the future. And I think it's actually uh, quite nice. Uh, but let's say you want to create a bind mount. So let's create something that we call slash bind mount. Actually, let's go uh, bind mount recursive in this case. Let's call it just like that. So, and then being lazy and copying the header and copying the bottom. And let's say, so what we want to do, um, so first of all, all right, variables that we need, and we say, because we're operating, I'm going to operate on my current Budapest, I'm going to create a new mount namespace. And uh, this mount namespace will make sure that I'm not going to alter the, my current mount name table and basically crash my computer. This requires us to include sketch.h, by the way. Um, and now we do uh, red mount. Uh, let's use the old mount API for that again. Uh, and see MS rec, MS private to mount my, turn my rootfs into a non-shared private mount so that nothing propagates out into and out of my mount namespace. Say we're dying right here with mount. And then let's do, so now we're calling open tree, which I've introduced before. And we, we say, uh, oops, uh, minus ebat f, because we're not operating based on a file descriptor here. And we're opening our root directory and we're specifying open tree. Close exec, make the file descriptor close on exec, open tree, clone, because we want to create a new detached mount, and add uh, recursive, because we want to copy every mount of our mount tree, and also add empty path. Um, actually, that's nonsense. Don't need that empty path. Um, okay. And now we say if the amount of D we get back is smaller zero, we can say die Erno uh, open tree in this case. And I should learn how to type. Okay, and now finally, again, we move this mount into place. Say so mount FD, again, minus EBATF, not operating based off a file descriptor in this case. And then move mount f empty path to specify that we are operating directly on the mount file descriptor right here for the source by Erno. And we can say again, move mount. And what we would expect to happen is that we recursively mount all of our complete rootfs to a location on mount. Actually, there is one step missing because mount namespaces. Um, what is he complaining about? Uh, what is this complaining about? Mount, make, um, find mount. Ah, okay. Well, that makes sense. Um, okay. Um, because we've created a new mount namespace and the mount namespaces only exist as long as they either bind mount or are referenced by the process um, that has created it. Um, we're going to do uh, run a new shell um, and we're going to say char star um, and then you can see. So we want to see our whole root of us appear in slash mount. Let's see. And then let's do sudo 
that's slash client now. If I'm going away because I misprogrammed something, um, great talk. Thank you for being here. Um, okay. And uh, now let's see. Oh, yes, everything, the whole root of S is, appears under um, slash MNT again. So we just created, we created a bind mount. Can log out, the uh, context is the uh, bind mount is automatically destroyed. And as you can see, um, these are two examples of how the new mount API worked. Um, should be, it's, it's fairly straightforward once you have gotten used to it to not like tie this all into one single syscall, but rather stretch this over, um, over multiple syscalls. But it is really way nicer. You create a mount and the creation of the mount is independent of uh, the appearance within the file system. And the move mount system call is where, um, where you actually attach a mount into the file system, which is just such a great, uh, great tool. But um, in any case, I hope uh, you learned something and you saw how the new mount API is not just structured, but also how it can be used in programs. Um, I'm probably going to make the demos available somewhere, probably on my homepage after um, after I've given this talk. And uh, that's basically um, that's basically it. We're uh, we're almost out of uh, we're almost out of time. And so there should be instructions on how you can ask me questions. And I'm excited to, I'm excited for that. So see you. Bye.